divisional round of the playoffs recap, as well as an NFL, AFC, and NFC championship round predictions video. So, if you happen to miss the divisional round of the playoffs, or if you're interested in hearing who I have winning in advancing to the Super Bowl next weekend, then uh, you've come to the right place. So, without further ado, let's jump into last weekend's uh, slates. So first up on Saturday, you had a game between the Baltimore Ravens and the Houston Texans. This is a matchup between the four seed and the one seed, and it takes place in Baltimore. Um, <coughs> this game was all tied up at halftime. Uh, it was a 10-10 battle at halftime. Lamar was visibly frustrated with his team. Uh, both teams were pretty, pretty limited on the offensive end. It was a rather defensive first half of the game. Then, uh, the Ravens came back out and they remembered who they were through the entire season. And so the Baltimore Ravens ended up finishing this game and winning with a final score of 34-10. to So they sent the Houston Texans home. Uh, they ended C.J. Stroud's amazing rookie campaign and D'Amico Ryan's amazing first year with the Texans. So let's break down what happened in this matchup. In terms of game leaders, you have C.J. Stroud completing 19 of 33 passes for 175 yards. And on the other hand, you have Lamar Jackson who completed 16 of 22 passes for 152 yards and two touchdowns. Now rushing the ball, there was Devin Singletary leading the way for the Houston Texans with nine carries for 22 yards. Whereas Lamar Jackson himself was the leading rusher for the Baltimore Ravens, and he got 11 carries for 100 yards and another two touchdowns. So that's a four touchdown game for Lamar Jackson in the playoffs. Then on the receiving side, you have Nico Collins leading the way for the Texans with five catches for 68 yards. Whereas for the Baltimore Ravens, you had Save Flowers who finished with four catches for 41 yards. In this game, you'll find that the Houston Texans were only able to muster up 213 total yards of offense, whereas the Baltimore Ravens were able to amass 352 yards of offense in this game. The game was relatively clean, with neither team turning the ball over at all, but time of possession was hugely dominated by the Ravens as they held on to the ball for 37 minutes and 35 seconds, whereas the Houston Texans were only able to touch it for 22 minutes and 25 seconds. So, taking a look at that offensive yardage, we can break it down into passing and rushing. In the passing game, the Texans finished with 175 yards, whereas the Ravens finished with 123 yards. And the reason why these are less than the quarterback passing yards is because you have to take into account the yards loss from sacks that is subtracted from the passing yard total in the offense. The Houston Texans did a great job of protecting CJ Stroud in this matchup. He suffered zero sacks and so they lost zero yards off of it. The Ravens on the other hand actually allowed three sacks to Lamar Jackson and they lost a total of 29 yards from these three sacks. Rushing the ball was the biggest difference in this game. You had the Houston Texans, who were only able to get 38 yards on the ground in this one, which is quite bad, quite, quite bad. Whereas the Ravens, they had free reign. They could run wherever they felt like on the field, and they finished this game with 229 rushing yards. So that's the biggest difference, almost 200 more yards rushing from the Ravens, and that probably explains why they were able to dominate in time of possession as well. <coughs> uh, when we think about red zone efficiency, uh, you have the Houston Texans not being able to move the ball at all in this game. They were able to reach the red zone zero times, and uh, thus they were never able to have a successful red zone attempt. The Ravens, on the other hand, they made the red zone five times, and they were able to convert that to a touchdown on four of their attempts. So four of five versus zero of zero. Penalties were also a huge, huge part of this game. The Texans suffered 11 penalties for 70 yards, whereas the Ravens only had 3 penalties for 15 yards. 
uh, along with all of this. One thing that did work out in the favor of the Texans was a punt return for a touchdown. Uh, their offense really couldn't do anything in this game, but luckily their special teams kept them in it up until halftime. So that is why they were able to tie the score up 10-10. to But yeah, um, penalties and inability to move the ball. If we take a look at their down efficiency, it's actually dead even between these two teams. Both the Texans and the Ravens were 4 of 12 on f third down, but on fourth down there was a bit of a difference. The Ravens were able to go for it twice on fourth down and convert on both of their attempts, whereas the Texans went for it once and they were unable to do anything. So, uh, yeah, worse on fourth down. They couldn't run the ball at all and they were very penalized. So, all these things led to a Houston Texans loss. But, you know, they had a very nice season. I don't think anyone expected them to make it to the divisional round of the playoffs. So, hats off to them. Uh, well deserved. Big contracts for a lot of these guys in the future. And a very bright team. Very bright future. Looking good ahead. Whereas the Ravens, they get to advance to the AFC Championship game. <coughs> Luckily for them, they are the one seed. So, they will be able to host their opponent rather than having to travel anywhere. After that, we move into the second game from the Saturday slate. This was a matchup between the seventh seed and the one seed in the NFC. The Green Bay Packers traveled to Santa Clara to play against the San Francisco 49ers. Um, this game was also very good. It I shouldn't say also the first game wasn't that good in terms of entertainment, but this one was very close, very entertaining. The 49ers were, uh, they ended up victorious with a final victory margin of 24 to 21. And let's take a look at how the quarterbacks performed in this one. You had Jordan Love, who had 21 of 34 passes completed for 194 yards, and he threw for two touchdowns, but he also threw two costly interceptions. Brock Purdy, on the other hand, threw 23 of 39 passes, um, and he had 252 yards and one touchdown. Rushing the ball, you had two pretty productive days from the star running max. Aaron Jones had 18 carries for 108 yards in this slippery and rainy matchup, whereas Christian McCaffrey had 17 carries for 98 yards and two touchdowns. It's a very productive day from him. Receiving the ball, Romeo Dobbs led the Green Bay Packers once again with four catches for 83 yards, whereas George Kittle was the leading receiver for the 49ers, hauling in four passes for 81 yards and also one touchdown. <coughs> Sorry, I had to clear my throat a little bit. Uh, if you like throat clearing, maybe that was pleasant for you. If not, maybe I'll edit that out. We'll see. Um, team stats. So, breaking down the offensive yardage in this game, it was actually quite close. You have the San Francisco 49ers finishing with 356 yards of total offense, whereas the Green Bay Packers were able to put together 330 yards. So, that's only a difference of 26 yards. Very close. In terms of turnovers, that unfortunately was led by the Green Bay Packers. They had two turnovers to the zero of the 49ers. And when it comes to time of possession, it was almost as even as it can get. You have the Packers holding on for 30 minutes and 19 seconds, whereas the 49ers saw the ball for 29 minutes and 41 seconds. So very even distribution in terms of offense. Uh, and a lot of the things really were quite similar. In terms of first downs, Green Bay had 20, uh, San Francisco had 19. And, okay, well, I'll break down the offensive yardage. You have 194 yards passing for the Green Bay Packers. You have 245 for the 49ers. Both teams did a good job of protecting their respective quarterbacks. Jordan Love was sacked zero times, so they lost zero yards off of it. Whereas, the San Francisco 49ers allowed Brock Purdy to be sacked one time, and they lost seven yards from it. Rushing the ball, there was an advantage to the Green Bay Packers. They finished with 136 yards, whereas the 49ers finished with 111. Uh, the red zone stats in this game are actually very, very important. Because 
Because you have the Green Bay Packers who finished with one of five efficiency from the red zone. They were able to make the red zone five times in this game, but they could only walk away with a touchdown in two of these trips. That was a huge reason why they didn't end up winning in this matchup. Whereas the San Francisco San Francisco 49ers, they were only able to make the red zone once, and they were successful in that attempt, but their other scores came from further out, uh, just long, long passes, long touchdowns. As I mentioned before, you had two interceptions from Jordan Love, also very critical in their loss. Um, one was towards the very end of the game, basically the 49ers were able to go down the field, score a touchdown and get the lead with three points. The Packers did have a chance to try and tie up the game or potentially win it, but on first down, with a lot of time left and a lot of field left to go, Jordan Love was running to the sidelines and he just threw the ball downfield inexplicably and it was intercepted. Uh, those are the kinds of moments where like, Jordan Love did have a pretty good game outside of that. He had a very solid, first year outing, but those are the kinds of plays that you look at and you know what to work on next year. Really, he should have sailed that ball out of bounds. There was no reason for him to have thrown it. He could have saved the time, uh, just, just get rid of it. Instead, he throws it into a crowded secondary and it, it cost them the ability to try and die the game. So, unfortunate mistake and it happened to come at the worst possible moment. Oh, another thing I forgot to mention, the penalties in this game. Green Bay actually was much better in the penalty category. They were only penalized one time for five yards, whereas the 49ers, they had six penalties for 83 yards. So, you know, the Packers, they did a decent amount right. They had the rushing advantage. They made the red zone more often. They didn't get penalized that much, but missed kicks. Obviously, everyone's talking about the Anders Carlson missed kick. Um, you have the two turnovers, which I would say played a bigger part, and you have the inefficiency in the red zone. So, all of that comes together and leads to a Green Bay Packers loss. But once again, one heck of a season. Uh, the Green Bay Packers, they just lost Aaron Rodgers, a recent two-time MVP, their franchise quarterback for the longest time. Big question mark with Jordan Love. You don't know if he's any good, and he's not only leads you into the postseason in his first ever season, but he's able to take down the two seed. So, great promise from him, great composure through that last stretch of the season. He almost took down the number one 49ers as well, so you have to give him a pat on the back. He did phenomenally uh, compared to the expectations, I would say, and there are bright things in his future as well. So, very nice job to the Packers, and once again, the 49ers, they win, they get to advance, and since they were the one seed, they will be hosting whatever the next team that comes their way for the NFC Championship. After that, you have the first game on Sunday. This was the Sunday morning game, which was the NFC game between the number three seeded Detroit Lions and number four seeded Tampa Bay Buccaneers. The, this game was also a lot of fun, very close, uh, pretty close. <coughs> through the first three quarters it was tied and then in the fourth quarter the Lions were able to run away with the lead. The final score in this matchup was 31 to 23 and taking a look at the offensive stats you have Baker Mayfield completing 26 of 41 passes for 349 yards and three touchdowns but unfortunately also two interceptions. Jared Goff on the other hand had another nice day with 30 of 43 passing yards, uh, 30 of 43 passes completed, um, with 287 yards and two touchdowns. Rushing the ball, you have Richard White leading the way for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers with nine carries for 55 yards, and for the Lions, you have Jameer Gibbs leading the way with nine carries for 74 yards and one touchdown. Surprisingly efficient days from both of these guys, considering how stout the opposing run defense was. So, I mean, they gave it their best. Then, receiving the ball, you had a magnificent day from Mike Evans. He put it all out there, uh, made some spectacular plays. He had eight catches for 147 yards and a touchdown. And for the Lions, 
you have none other than Amon Ra St. Brown once again leading the way for the Lions with 8 catches for 77 yards and a touchdown. So, looking at the team stats, you'll find that it was very close. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers were able to put up 408 yards of offense, whereas the Lions put up 391, so a very heavy hitting offensive matchup in this game. Uh, only a difference of 17 yards, but uh, one of the unfortunate parts for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are the two turnovers that they suffered to the zero of the Lions. So, <clears throat> so far we've seen that each of the victors in these first three matchups were able to win without turning the ball over at all, which is pretty critical. Then, looking at time of possession, you'll see that the Lions were able to hold on to the ball for 32 minutes exactly, and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers got the ball for 28 minutes exactly. So, uh, diving into that offensive yardage, if we take a look piece by piece, we'll see that the Tampa Bay Buccaneers had 319 yards to the air, and the Lions had 277 through the air. This is because the Buccaneers allowed four sacks to Baker Mayfield for a total of 30 yards loss, whereas the Lions allowed uh, Jared Goff to be sacked twice, and they lost 10 yards on those two sacks. Uh, after that, you have the rushing of the ball. The Lions led by a slim margin in this one. You have the Lions finishing with 114 yards on the ground, whereas the Tampa Bay Buccaneers finished with 89 yards. Uh, red zone efficiency. Both teams were able to hammer it in for a touchdown three times. The Lions went three of four on their attempts, whereas the Tampa Bay Buccaneers were a perfect three of three. And then in terms of penalties, the Buccaneers were slightly worse in this one. They were penalized five times for 33 yards, whereas the Lions were penalized three times for 17 yards. Uh, taking a look at third and fourth down efficiency, you'll find that the Buccaneers finish 4 of 12 on third down, whereas the Lions finish 6 of 14, so a slight edge to the Lions in that category. And on fourth down, both teams went for it once, and they were both able to convert once. So, even over there. Um, but really, what this game came down to is the turnovers. You had a turnover in the first half from Baker Mayfield, he just threw an interception. Uh, honestly, it wasn't necessarily his fault. It came off the hands of one of his receivers, and it, loft it was lofted into the air, and the Lions secondary was able to grab it and take that possession away from the Bucks. The other one was far more costly. Um, the Lions were leading by like two scores in the fourth quarter, so it was a 14-point hole for the Buccaneers. They got the ball. They were able to charge down the field and get one score, and then they opted to go for a two-point conversion rather than a regular field goal. They did not convert on the two-point attempt, and I think there was a very good no-call in the back of the end zone. You had Mike Evans pedaling backwards, and he was being covered by Cam Sutton, maybe, and he just was never in a position where, like, he could really get to the ball. He was going too far back, and so I don't think there was any interference, really. Um, so the Bucks walked away with six points. Then the Lions were stopped, and the Buccaneers got the ball back with a perfect opportunity. A little under two minutes. I think they still had a timeout or two. But uh, in their first couple of throws, Baker Mayfield throws an interception, and that pretty much sealed the game. Uh... And so, yeah, the Lions, they got a first down, and that was pretty much it. After that, they were able to kneel it all the way till the end and run out the time. Now, there was a little bit of controversy when it came to the kneeling at the very end of the game. Uh, the Lions, they snapped the ball early on their third down possession. So, rather than actually being able to expire the clock fully, theoretically, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers could have taken a timeout to force the Lions into a fourth down attempt, and obviously you can't kneel on fourth down, so this would have forced the Lions to probably go for a field goal, and it would have been a 48-yard attempt. Now, at this point in the game, the Buccaneers, they had one timeout. They're down eight, and they would have forced the Lions into a 
cat a 48 yard attempt and then they would have received a kickoff with about 12 seconds left in the game and the Buccaneers opted not to do this uh, they just let the time run out and the game ended Todd Bowles was questioned about this after the game and he was like yeah you know we we weren't really going to come back from that they were they already had the field goal unit ready uh, would have been two possession game and what are we going to do so why delay the inevitable and waste everyone's time so some people are upset with Todd Bowles' comments there they think that this is an outrage that he should have fought to the very last second and that it is a huge coaching malpractice the fact that Todd Bowles did not call a timeout there when the Lions messed up on snapping the ball early now I understand both sides of this argument um if I myself am a Tampa Bay Buccaneers fan I am trying to fight until the very end I do not want to accept a loss especially in the playoffs you really want to cling on to any little bit of hope that you have so I understand that and I get where fans are coming from in this criticism you see like crazy things have happened you know you have the Miami miracle you have the Minnesota miracle sometimes there's such a tiny tiny chance that you can win it but it happens to pan out but I also fully understand Todd Bowles' side of this argument it's not a reasonable level of odds like it's not even that you're down six points or seven points you are down a full eight points to a team that is in field goal range and they ideally were going to run out the clock and maybe they snapped it a bit early so best case scenario you are hoping that you're able to stop the clock that the opposing team misses a kick that with no timeouts and 12 seconds left you go down the entire length of the rest of the field score a touchdown and then convert the two-point attempt just for a shot at overtime not even to win the game at overtime and so that's a string of very unlikely things that all need to happen very quickly and at this point in the game i think everyone has accepted the loss really you had the perfect opportunity in that last drive before the interception and that is where they were focusing their efforts that really was the time to catch up yes he could have taken that time out but i think at that stage of the game i don't blame him for not doing it they had a good season they will reflect they will figure out what they did wrong in this game and they'll learn how they can proceed next season but I don't think that Todd Bowles did anything wrong by allowing them to run out those last 30 seconds. I think it's fine. So yeah, after that, you have your final matchup of the divisional round. This was the Sunday night game between the Kansas City Chiefs and the Buffalo Bills. Uh, the Kansas City Chiefs are the three seed in this game and the Buffalo Bills were the two seed. So this game was being played in Buffalo, New York, but nonetheless, Patrick Mahomes was able to pull off his first ever road victory in the AFC and the Chiefs walk away victorious with a final score of 27 to 24. Now I can't lie I was very much rooting for the Buffalo Bills in this one even though I'm a Patriots fan myself and that's because I just wanted something new in the AFC. You know Patrick Mahomes, Andy Reid, they're very dominant. This is the sixth straight year they'll be in the AFC Championship game. And obviously, this is kind of ironic coming from a Patriots fan who was, you know, the team that was in that position before. But I don't really have any animosity against the Chiefs. I just wanted to see something new. <laughs> and so I was hoping that Buffalo was going to be able to pull it off. And unfortunately, they could not. They really had it. They truly did have it. And then they choked it away. So very unfortunate. In this game, you have Patrick Mahomes completing 17 of 23 passes for 215 yards and two touchdowns. Whereas, you had Josh Allen, on the other hand, completing 26 of 39 passes for 186 yards and a touchdown. Rushing the ball, Isaiah Pacheco led the way with 15 carries for 97 yards and one touchdown for the Chiefs. And Josh Allen himself 
led the way for the Bills with 12 carries for 72 yards and two touchdowns. Receiving the ball, it was a tight end dominated day with Travis Kelsey finishing with five catches for 75 yards and two touchdowns, whereas Dalton Kincaid was the leading receiver for the Bills with five catches for 45 yards. Now looking at the total offense in this game, you'll actually find in a lot of these stats, the Bills had the best of the Chiefs. The Bills finished with slightly more total yardage, 368 yards to the 361 of the Kansas City Chiefs, so that's an advantage of 7. Then when it comes to turnovers, the Chiefs lost the turnover battle 1-0. to zero. When it comes to first downs, Buffalo had 27 first downs and the Chiefs had 21. In time of possession, the Bills heavily dominated in this game with 37 minutes and 3 seconds of ball time, whereas the Chiefs had the ball for 22 minutes and 57 seconds. Uh, when talking about third down efficiency, Buffalo had great success on third down, going 7 of 14, whereas the Chiefs were 1 of 5. Fourth down efficiency, the Chiefs never went for on fourth down, whereas Buffalo was 2 of 3. And that, that third one, it was really one of their biggest mistakes in the game. Um, then, yeah, passing the ball, there was an edge to the Chiefs. You have 215 yards to the air versus 186 for the Bills. Both teams allowed zero sacks in this game. Very, very good protection in this one. Rushing the ball, there was an advantage to the Bills. They finished with 182 yards on the ground to the 246 of the Chiefs. In the red zone, both teams made the red zone four times, but the Bills were 3 of 4 in the red zone, and the Chiefs were 2 of 4 in the red zone. In terms of penalties, the Buffalo Bills were slightly worse. They were penalized five times for 28 yards, versus the Chiefs were penalized two times for 15 yards. And, yeah, that one turnover, basically, the fourth quarter of this game was crazy. You had the Chiefs scoring the ball taking the lead 27-24. Then after that, Buffalo was given a shot. They got the ball. They didn't do anything with it. And after that, uh, actually, I think Josh, Josh Allen threw like a 60-yard strike to Stephon Diggs, and he just flat out did not catch it. It was a beautiful ball, uh, at least 60 yards, and it would have set them up in the red zone. It was truly a magnificent throw, and Diggs just couldn't haul it in. Um, so yeah, they couldn't convert. Then it was fourth and five at like their own 30. And the Bills, I guess they noticed that the Chiefs only had 10 people out on their punting unit instead of 11. And they decided they were gonna try and capitalize on this. So they ran a fake punt from their own 30 yard line, snapping the ball to Damar Hamlin. He got like, three of the necessary seven yards or something like that and the Chiefs took over now at this point the Bills had all the momentum in the game they were leading for the longest time or actually no it was pretty back and forth but they had just been leading prior to this and it seemed like it was a back and forth game so it was their time to strike had they just kicked the ball on the other side of the field I don't think that the Chiefs would have necessarily scored but now, obviously, it's at least three points or seven points. So, it looked doomed. It looked so doomed for the Bills. The Chiefs went down the field. The, like, 30 yards they needed, they got 29. They do, like, some sort of trick play with McCall Hardman. He had a carry. He fumbles the ball. Not only does he fumble the ball, he fumbles it through the end zone. So, by the rules, that's a touchback. So, the Bills get the ball back at the 20 yard line. So even though they had one of the most, one of the worst play calls ever, where they went for it at their own 30, with quite a bit of yardage, um, and then didn't get it, they did not pay for that mistake at all. So they get the ball, they go down the field, they, they waste a decent amount of time, then they, they truly screwed the pooch. They had a few shots. They were set up in field goal range, basically. It's like a 40, 45 yard field goal, 44 yard field goal. But it's first down or second down. 
rather than going for another, like, first down, Josh Allen zones in completely on the end zone. The first pass is, honestly, th the read was great. Uh, I think Shakir was open in the end zone, and Josh Allen was targeting him. And the ball just couldn't reach Shakir because Josh Allen was hit as he was throwing. So, yeah, he weighs the second down, now it's third down. Rather than going for the first down, and you had like digs on an underneath route, it was pretty open. Josh Allen like scrambles and then throws it into the end zone ish, and it's not caught. So, there was like there was so much time on the clock. I don't know why he was going for a final strike there, because even if you do get that touchdown, it's the Chiefs. You don't want them to have any time on their hands. Like, that's the one thing like, you would think after losing. When there are 13 seconds on the clock, Josh Allen's priority would be to run out the clock, and they needed, like, a couple yards for the first down. Like, it was definitely doable. But they choose to go for two end zone strikes there. Now they're forced to kick it. It's a very doable kick. But Tyler Bass misses it. He misses the 44-yard field goal wide right. And the Bills lose this game. And, man, you know, I don't really, I don't, I'm not a Buffalo Bills fan at all. Um, and usually I'm not rooting for them. But I kind of feel for them this time. Like, that is brutal. The game was in your hands for a decent part of the game, then it went to the Chiefs, then you almost lost it, and then you regained it, you had all the momentum, you had all the opportunity, and you fully let it slip away, and I don't, I, I'm not gonna blame Josh Allen at all, uh, I feel like he did his part, he did a lot with his legs, he put up a lot of good balls that just weren't caught, and one of those two final throws was a good read, maybe the third down one, I would, I would have done that differently, but truly, the fourth down fake punt and the missed field goal, that is going to sting, and yeah, uh, truly, truly heartbreaking for the Buffalo Bills, they had a rocky season, finished it out very strong, won a playoff game, hosted the Chiefs, and yet they lose once again, and Patrick Mahomes is just, he's too nice, he's too nice with it, he owns them. Uh, yeah, now Patrick Mahomes is 3-0 against Josh Allen in the postseason. He won his first ever road AFC game, so that narrative's done. Um, and he goes to his sixth straight AFC championship game. Uh, every year that he's been a starter, he has been in that AFC championship game. He's already set so many records in terms of passing and, like, touchdowns and all of these things. These Chiefs, they're just they're so good, <laughs> even in their off year, this is their, they, they don't have an off year, 11 and 6, it doesn't matter, they're still in the AFC Championship game, so, you know, the AFC, as much as anyone else is trying to make a run at it, it still fully runs to the Kansas City Chiefs, and they will be traveling to Baltimore next week to play against the Ravens, um, which will be a very fun matchup, so, yeah, that concludes last weekend's action. All of the divisional playoff games from last game, last weekend. Now, we only have two games this upcoming weekend. It will be the AFC Championship and the NFC Championship. So, I will go into the predictions part of this video now. Of these two games, the first will be the Chiefs versus the Ravens, which will take place on Sunday, January 28th at 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. You have the number one seeded Ravens going against the number three seeded Chiefs. Uh, the last time these two teams met up, it was a very, very fun game. I believe the Ravens walked away with the victory. Um, I'm trying to think if they have met in the postseason. I don't, I don't believe that they have. Uh, so that will be very interesting. This is Lamar Jackson's first ever AFC Championship game. So very happy for him. Holmes has been here. I mean, he owns this place. He's been here all the time. So, even though the Ravens have home field advantage, Mahomes knows what it's like to be in these moments, and he is truly, like, 
the most experienced quarterback in these playoffs, which is crazy. He's literally in his sixth season, but he is the Fed now. Um, and yeah, it'll be an interesting matchup. The Ravens this year have been a next level of dominant, though. They led in like every major defensive category. Their offense was spectacular. Um, Lamar Jackson will most likely win the MVP off of a lot of injuries this season uh, to their offense. And the thing that sticks out to me the most is the stat I saw about the Ravens beating winning teams. The Ravens this season have beaten 11 teams with a winning record. So you could say like they're the opposite of the Dolphins. Other teams that beat 11 winning teams in one season. I believe it was the Patriots, it was the Steelers, and it was one other team. All three of those teams went on to win the Super Bowl. And I do think that the Ravens are a next level of good this season. Like, this is truly their shot to make a run at it. Uh, they look great. As good as the Chiefs are, they were worse in most categories. They walked away with it in the end because of the Bills' own stupidity. But the Ravens dominated against the Texans in that second half. And it just goes to show, like, even if you think you can compete with the Ravens, it might only be for half the time. They are nice. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to pick the Ravens to win that matchup and have the Ravens advance to their first Super Bowl with Lamar Jackson at the quarterback. After that, at 3.30 p.m. on Sunday, January 28th, you have the NFC Championship game between the Detroit Lions and the San Francisco 49ers. This is a game that will take place in San Francisco. Um, and, you know, two teams that are fighting very hard to get to the Super Bowl. The Lions, they've never been. They have never been to a Super Bowl. So this would be unprecedented grounds. They would be shooting for something that's never been done in team history before. And honestly, it would be remarkable. I think any NFL fan would be happy to see this happen. Like, it would be truly a wonderful moment for the team, for the city of Detroit, for anyone who has ever watched a Lions game. It would be wonderful. Whereas the 49ers, they have been great. They, in the last five years, have made the NFC Championship game like four times. Um, they've been right at the top, right at the cusp, and they just haven't been able to do it. Um, they made it to that Super Bowl against the Chiefs, and they lost that one. That was a couple quarterbacks ago. Now you have Brock Purdy. You have all these guys. And the only thing that I think could stop them is the loss of Debo Samuel. Last week in the game, in the rain against the Packers, Debo Samuel suffered a bit of an injury. It has yet to be determined whether he plays in this Lions game or not. But I think that the 49ers have full strength. They are just too good. They are too nice. Uh, they're, they're really great in every aspect of the game. Whereas the Lions, the Lions secondary is like chop lover, you know. Uh, the 49ers will capitalize on that all day. They have so many weapons and Purdy can throw it for sure very well. So I don't know if the Lions can hang around if all the weapons are healthy. But if Debo is out, then you you can see it like the Packers only allowed the 49ers to get into the red zone one time. So maybe the Lions would have some success there. They've got a very nice defensive front. As much as I am a people's champion, and I personally would be very excited to see the Lions in the Super Bowl, uh, I don't think I can have them beating the 49ers just based on what I've seen this season. Like, the 49ers really are the second best team in the league. And for a long time, I thought they were the first team. But then they played the Ravens and they got smacked. So, the 49ers, best team in the NFC. They didn't, they didn't do, like, an amazing job of destroying the Packers. But it was a rain game. You lost one of your best offensive weapons. And you still won. So, very good perseverance in that one. And I think they'll be able to hold off the Lions. So I'm going to go with the 49ers winning this game. We'll have a Super Bowl rematch between the Ravens and the 49ers. That is my prediction for this year's Super Bowl. And yeah, I am predicting two things. One, 
that the 49ers will be the first team to break the Kirk Cousins curse. If you have not heard, there is this curse that's been floating around that states that no team that has ever lost to Kirk Cousins in the regular season has ever gone on to advance to the Super Bowl in that year. But there's another theory that has been circulating, and it is the Super Bowl logo theory. This was pointed out way earlier in the season when both the Ravens and the 49ers first climbed to the one division, the one seed in their respective conferences. And it highlights that in the last couple years, the teams that were playing in the Super Bowl also happened to be the colors that were found on the, like, emblem or logo of this year's Super Bowl. This year it was red and purple, and so people pointed out that it could be the Ravens and 49ers. So, yeah, I'm predicting that that will be the way that it pans out. Um, truly, any way that this goes, it'll be a fun Super Bowl, just because if you have, say, the Chiefs make it, so it's the Chiefs and Niners, that's a Super Bowl, like, rematch from just a couple years ago, so that could be cool. If you have the Ravens and the Lions instead of the 49ers, I think that's the, the People's Champion Super Bowl. You have two teams that haven't been in it recently. The Ravens, it's been like 10 years. The Lions, it's been never. It would be very cool to see what would happen in that game. And the other way, if you have the Lions and Chiefs, it would be a full circle moment. The NFL season started off this year with the Lions beating the Chiefs in that opening game. It was a big shocker. What would be a more complete way to end the season than to bring it up back with that exact matchup and see how they're able to end the year? Um, so yeah, regardless of what the Super Bowl is, I'll enjoy it. It'll be a lot of fun. But my personal thing, my personal pick is Ravens 49ers. So yeah, thanks for watching. If you enjoy content like this, feel free to like, comment, or subscribe. I'll be putting out another video as this week progresses. It'll be another uh, prize picks type video. I didn't do as well on last weekend's picks, but I'll wait until the next video to get 